Good morning. Good morning. It is truly good to see your faces. Okay. Uh, wonderful to be together. Um, of course, we're obviously practicing social distancing. Um, the offering we will skip over in the service because the plate's in the back, right? So when you either came in or when you leave, you can put your offering in there. Um, so we'll skip over that in the service. We will be substituting the Athanasian Creed on page 319 today uh, in place of the Nicene Creed because it's Holy Trinity Sunday, right? And that is the strongest creed we have for the Trinity. It's very long. You can see why we normally don't practice it in services, but today we will do that. Um, and I'll say it again at that time. I will take the odds, odd verses. You guys will take the even and we'll, you know, responsibly back and forth read it, okay? Um, the lessons today, um, you know, i got to be honest with you, I don't think there's any problem with touching the hymnals and, and the Bibles in there. We've talked about that because we're not, we don't have any midweek services right now. They say if COVID gets on there, it only lasts for 72 hours anyways. Um, and so, consequently, we should be have no problem, right, if we have services the next Sunday. There should be no issue. So when, we, when I read the lessons, they are extensive lessons today for this Sunday. And so I would suggest that you might want to open the Bible there that's in the pew and you might want to read along with me. That's up to you, okay? But, but they're, they're extensive lessons, very long lessons for today, okay? All right? Um, and then it's totally up to you guys, like, afterwards. Um, I'm going to suggest this, okay? We talked about this. If you want to stay around and talk, which I can see people doing that. People were doing it beforehand because they haven't seen each other, right? So if you want to do that, do it outside, okay? And then just practice your social distancing outside. That's what I would suggest, okay? And I don't care if you want to hang around for an hour afterwards. It doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter to me, whatever, if you want to talk to somebody. But let's do that outside. That way, we're not, you know, like jamming all up in the narthex here, okay? All right? And communion. When we do communion, what's going to happen is, is uh, you'll be ushered up. You will pick up your wafer, your individual cup, okay? Um, and then you'll come over here, and I'm going to put a face shield on when I do communion because I'll be closer to you, okay? And then I will just, like we normally do, right? I'll do, you know, I'll just take you through it right here, you know, and it'll basically be like, you know, if you're a couple or family or whatever, you're together anyways, right? So we'll bring you up, and then, and then you'll go back, okay? That's the way we're going to do it for right now. Right, um, and uh, and please be respectful of each other. You know, I know there's some you know that, that feel they need to wear masks. There's some that feel that they don't. There's some that have to wear them during the week where they work at, and consequently, the last thing they want to do is wear one, you know, to church or on the weekend. That's fine, but we have to be accepting of everybody and where they're at. And people have different reasons, right? Some you know have elderly parents and those types of things, and I totally understand that. And know that. Know that when I go to visit, like, the elderly, when they invite me in, like, in their homes and things, I wear one, okay? Because I just wouldn't, you know what I mean, in that particular situation, you know, it's, it's a little different, so, okay? All right, even at this point, then, all right? I think, I think we covered everything, I hope, uh, at this point. And, you know, we'll kind of refrain from the handshaking and hugging, but that's kind of up to you guys. If, you, if both people are okay with it, well, then who am I to... Stand in the way, right? I have to say these things, you understand, for the most part. All right, so, okay, we're all, we're all set? All right, let's uh, bow our heads for prayer and then we'll start into the service for today. Okay. Our good and gracious Lord, we come before you and we just thank you for your wonderful blessing. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we're able to come together and worship you. Um, and we will continue to hold services, Lord, for those who want to come out and and uh, we just pray for all of our members, Lord, that uh, you keep them all safe. Uh, we know that you will, Lord, according to the power of the Holy Spirit. And we just ask that you keep us on a straight and narrow, Lord, according to your word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. <laughs>
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are yet to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, we see the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declare us to be your children, and gather us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins, and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, and live in our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. Let us give glory to him because he has shown his mercy to us. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you shall not abandon my soul to shield or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. Let us give glory to him because he has shown his mercy to us. Our first lesson, the Old Testament lesson for this, the Holy Trinity Sunday, 
is taken from Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. This is a very extensive lesson, so this is one. It's up to you if you want to just listen or if you want to look it up in the Bible and you and follow along. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was all form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, the fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from night, and let them be for signs for the seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning on the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth, Across the expanse of the heavens, and God created the great sea creatures, and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth and over every living creature that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in it fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has a breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that he, what he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them and on the seventh day, God finished his work that had been done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth, and when they were created. Here ends the Old Testament reading, and this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson for today is taken from Acts chapter 2, beginning at the first part of verse 14. 
Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he was at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced, and my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he had both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all of the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise. Infinite, 
the Son infinite, and the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated, or three infinites, but one uncreated, and one infinite. In the same way the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, and the Holy Spirit is almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also we are prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is not made, nor created, nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another. But all three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as have been stated above, the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time the God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and He is man, born from the stubborn substance of His mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh. Equal to the Father with respect to His divinity, less than the Father with respect to His humanity. Although He is God and man, He is not two, but one by us. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of persons. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. Who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead. Ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And at his coming all the people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the path of faith. faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. saved. Please be seated.
God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, you know, in every relationship, there's always challenges, isn't there, in life for all of us. And you know, the one thing I've thought about is, you know, Adam may have had his troubles, but at least he didn't happen to listen to Eve talk to him about the man that she could have married, right? So we didn't have to worry about that. Well, on a more serious note here, because of original sin of Adam in Genesis chapter 3, what we believe is a matter of people, life, and death. Contrary to worldly belief, there really is ultimate evil. There really is. You know, the devil and hell really exist, and the ultimate good, the triune God in heaven, they really do exist. I know this, if you have the blues, God will tell you that he's always with you. In Psalm 27, he says, whom shall I fear? If you feel like things are a little tight, you might want to go to Psalm 37, because that addresses those issues for you, where God says, I take care of all of your needs. If people seem unkind, then you might want to go to John chapter 15 and read that, where he talks about, I am the vine and you are the branches. As long as you stay connected, I look out for you. If you're discouraged in your work, you might want to go to Psalm 126. And in there it tells you what great things God has done for all of us. And if you are all out of sorts, so to speak, you may want to go to the 12th chapter of Hebrews and take a look at that. And it explains so explicitly there how God gives us heaven through faith. And if you can't have your own way, which I've left you, you're different than me, we don't get our own way all the time, just keep silent and, and I would recommend to you that you read the third chapter of James and it will talk to you, it will speak to you. Your heart is open, your soul is open. And you will find out that all wisdom comes not from man, but from heaven. It comes from heaven. God the Father gave us the Bible through the special power of the Holy Spirit to inspire men. The Old Testament is written about the Son, the Savior, who would come. And the New Testament, of course, is the fulfillment of that. All given that we might be saved. 2 Timothy 3.16 Revelation chapter 22 talk about the truth of God's word and that we must accept all of it. All of it. We have an awesome God, folks. We have an awesome God. And he's bigger than anything that's going on in this world today. Far, far bigger. There's a common worldly belief today that all people who acknowledge that there is a God pray and worship the same God. No false. It's not right, folks. And we have to ask ourselves, how can this be? How can this possibly be? The Christians worship the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We just confessed to it here in the Athanasian Creed, right? Um, come on. You know, the Jews do not worship the triune God because they're still waiting for the Messiah. If you've ever talked to any Jews, you know that Jesus was just a great prophet in their eyes who died on a cross, not God's son, to deliver God's people uh, once and for all, uh, all of humanity. The Muslims, Islam, signifies peace, submission to God's will, and obedience to God's laws. But that's according to the Quran, not the Bible. The Quran, which is more important than the Christian Bible. Muslims accept Jesus as a prophet, but not the Son of God, and not divine. And the Quran states that holy wars are just. Allah will bless those who kill the infidels. And by the way, that's us. We're the infidels. Okay, just want to make that clear. Uh, because we don't believe as they do. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that their faith is a true rev uh, re no, excuse me, revelation of one faith mentioned by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4 or 5. The rest of Christianity is wrong, and thus all the rest of us are not saved. Jesus did not defeat the devil, but his heavenly rule did not happen until 1914. 
Okay? Um, and at the second coming of Jesus, 144,000 will reside in heaven, and everybody else will reside in a altered earth. They had to come up with that later, by the way, because when their when their membership, you know, exceeded the 144,000, the members were asking, "Geez, I wonder if I'm one of the 144,000 or not." Right? Am I saved or am I going to hell? See? So you know they have to keep all really all altering their beliefs, right, to to accommodate their people. How could all these different beliefs pray to the same God? How is it, you know, Christians acknowledge a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, while others acknowledge only the Father, and some only acknowledge the Son. Some acknowledge the Son, but not the Father. In most cases, the Holy Spirit just seems to kind of get lost out there somewhere. For most religions, except Christian, the God that is worshipped is dead and at least is not active in the world that he created. Oh, how the devil leads people astray from the word of God. But you know, this is nothing new. It's nothing new. Early in the 4th century, a North African pastor named Arius began teaching that Jesus Christ was not truly God. The church responded decisively in A.D. 325 with a statement of faith, the Nicene Creed that we use in our services. They said, we need something that our people can confess their faith, the fact that they believe in the triune God, to you know, refute what Arius is out there when each teaching is, is false. During the Reformation, radical groups espoused various forms of earlier heresies, wrong beliefs, that is, heresies being wrong beliefs about God. It is good for us at this time to review what our church teaches about God, I think. The Augsburg Confession of the original Lutheran churches in Germany strongly affirms the doctrine of the Trinity confessed at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. and later affirmed the Council of Constantinople in 381 A.D. Article 1 proves that Lutheranism is deeply anchored in the historic doctrine of biblical Christianity. In other words, don't tell the other Christians this, but we're the original Christians. We are. Okay. Um, it embraces the faith of the church through the ages and rejects all the errors of the church that the church has rejected. Our churches teach with common consent that the decree of Council of Nicaea about the unity of the divine essence and the three persons is absolutely true. It is to be believed without doubt God is divine and his divine essence is eternal without a body, without parts of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness. He is a maker and preserver of all things, visible and invisible, Nehemiah tells us. Yet there are three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit from Matthew 28, right, our gospel for today. These three persons are of the same essence and power. Our churches use the term person as the fathers have used it. And we use it to signify not a part or a quality in another, but that which subsists of itself. Our churches condemn all heresies, Titus chapter 3, that arose against this article, such as the Manichaeans, who assume that there are two principles, one good and the other evil. We also condemn the Valentinians, the Arians, the Idumeans, the Muslims, and all heresies such as these. Our churches also condemn the Samothathians, old and new, who contend that God is but one person. Not a trinity that we believe in, but one person. Okay? Through sophistry, now sophistry, if you don't know what that means, that's complicated thinking. Okay? Through complicated thinking, they impiously argue that the Word, with a capital W, Jesus, okay, and the Holy Spirit, are not distinct persons. You see the problem? They say that the word signifies a spoken word, not the living word, Jesus Christ. Well, that's kind of idiotic, because if you look at the first chapter of John, John says, in the beginning was the word, right? With a capital W. It's crazy. It's right in God's word. Speaking of the living word, in, uh, as well, you know, um, if we couple these verses together, if we take Genesis, 
that we just had here from one of our lessons, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. To the beginning, God the Father created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay, so we have God the Father, we have the Holy Spirit there. So if we go to John chapter 1, we see that Jesus Christ was there when the world was created, right? The Word, with a capital W, was there before the world was even created. Just had this discussion with a Christian this past week. Um, and had to do some explaining, so that was good. I'm glad they asked me about it. The words Trinity and Triune are not mentioned themselves in Scripture, but but the concept of the Triune God is all throughout the Bible, people. It is very evident. Our Gospel lesson today is a prime example, also known as the Great Commission. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, for and go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Those I find very comforting words myself, and you should also. I am with you to the very end of the age, no matter what. I think to allay if you will, all the disciples' fears and banish their doubts, Jesus assured them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he said, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. No sooner had he spoken than he was lifted up before their bulging eyes, and they saw him no more. These words that seemed like a puzzle to the disciples at the time, have been no empty promise. There is plenty of evidence that Jesus continues to walk on the earth even though no one has seen him. Proof, at that time, there were only a handful of disciples at Jesus' time. Today, Christ's followers totally encircle the globe. His followers totally encircle the globe. And we're not even sure exactly what the figure is, to be honest with you, how many Christians there actually are. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us in one of the physical and spiritual acts of the Trinity, holy baptism, we receive the free gifts from God, forgiveness of sins, power over sin and Satan, and never-ending life. For us as Christians, the miracle of baptism and repeated confession of our sins Praying and studying of God's Word are all part of a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a mighty Savior is our God. Before Abraham was, I am, John chapter 8 says. People don't think that this is boring or doesn't relate to me. It's personal for all of us. Today, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, right from Luke chapter 2. This Savior died for me so that now the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from sin. 1 John chapter 1. I am with you always. This very same Emmanuel means God with us. This means, this promise is true. God has kept it. Now you might think that in this relationship, you would be a slave. But I would say to you, no. Jesus is our friend, the friend who laid down his life for us, the sheep. Because of this, Peter reminds us that Jesus said, cast all your anxiety on me, and I will care for you. Some translations actually say, I will give you rest. From 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. You know, I've thought about this numerous times. I, a sinful mortal, have been chosen to do the work that, to be honest with you, more rightly, God might have assigned to angels in heaven. And then Jesus reminds me, I am with you always. I am with you always. At times, the devil whispers in my ear that the Father's work is useless and boring, and that it's okay to be a lazy Christian. I am helplessly weak. The triune God is helpfully strong. And I need him, folks, every hour, every minute, every day. Longfellow could take a worthless sheet of paper and write a poem on it and make it worth $6,000. I would call that genius. 
Rockefeller could sign his name to a piece of paper and make it worth millions. People would call that capital. Uncle Sam can take gold, stamp an eagle on it, and make it worth $20, and we call that money. A mechanic can take material worth $5 and make an article worth $20 or more, and I would call that skill. An artist can take a 50 cent piece of canvas and paint, paint a picture on it and make it worth a million dollars. And we call that art. God, God can take a worthless, sinful life and he can wash it in the blood of Christ. He can put his spirit into it and make it a blessing to all of humanity and people that we call salvation. Salvation. And you know what? You can't put a price on that. You cannot put a price on salvation. At every moment of each day, Jesus promises this. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I want to share something with you. Uh, I think in this time, and uh, let me say this first of all, this is not a political speech, okay? I'm not going to mention any political parties, anything of that nature. But I think at this time in our world, there's a great lot of fear, a great lot of fear out there among people. And I feel remiss if I don't at least try to address this a little bit today and give some comfort here before I end this sermon message. And I really would like you to open those Bibles that are in the pews right now and look at Psalm 32 with me, first of all. Psalm 32. Okay. Swords will pierce their own hearts. 
and their bowls will be broken. Verses 23 and 24. If the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Verses 27 and 28 of that same uh, Psalm 37. Turn from evil and do good, then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. Will not forsake his faithful ones. And then the last two verses of that chapter, verses 39 and 40. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and he saves them because they take refuge in him. Now, I was praying about this, you know, and I was thinking about fear. And it occurred to me as I was studying and I, and I was looking at this, that many times in the Bible it talks about fear of God. And it talks about fear of the Lord. And then it says fear of the Lord. Those three, those three statements, okay? Fear of God, fear of the Lord, fear of the Lord. And it occurred to me, those you know that there's over 60 references when you include those three of fearing the Lord. And I want to clarify something here. It occurred to me as I was studying this, you know, I mean, I guess I knew this, but it, it seemed like a good thing to share today. And that is, the real answer to fear is another meaning of the word fear, which is fear of the Lord. Does that make sense? The real answer to fear is actual fear of the Lord. And that word fear, when it's used in regards to the Lord, in the same statement with the Lord or our God, that fear means respect, right? Basically the word respect. I respect God. I respect Him for who He is, all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present in any place, okay? I respect my God. Respect for God is the answer to fear in this world. Uh, you know, our world today is out of control, and I think we all know that. I don't think there's anybody sitting here that doesn't realize that. And, you know, fear is the devil's tool that he loves to use against all of us. Uh, fear does terrible things to people. Terrible things. And we know that physical things uh, it can mess with your mind. Um, you know, it can cause illness. Fear is a terrible thing. And the devil is a fear monger. God is a peace monger, so to speak. Okay? Uh, and so we need to put our trust where it belongs, or keep our trust where it belongs, I guess I would say. And that's in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if we do that, then we as Christians should not live in fear. At least not as to what's going to happen to us or where we're going to go because we know where we're headed and what we have, that we have heaven and we have forgiveness of sins. In the world today, it's amazing to me, and here again, I'm not going to mention any political parties, but I am going to say this. It's amazing to me that if you are paying attention to what's going on at all out there, you will realize, and I just want you to think about this, okay? you will realize that the people that are causing all the problems are not the conservatives, but the liberals. The liberals are the ones that are causing the problems in this world today. And I want you to think about something. We have liberals out there marching. Man, black lives matter, right? Black lives matter. But the same people say that abortion's okay. What? You know what God's Word says, people. Um, and I put this in the same realm, you know, I was thinking about this, as when the Revolutionary War happened. You know, people had to make decisions, right? On which side they were going to be on. And pastors 
had to make decisions as well. And you know that when the Minutemen went up against the British, in a lot of cases their pastors went right along with them and fought right side by side with the other men, and many of them died as well and ministered to the soldiers. We live in a world, people, where as Christians, we have to take a stand. And I will just say this in closing, and this is for all of us to think about. We either believe the things that are taught in God's Word or we don't. Right? In Jesus' precious name.